Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is The Duke of Bad Medicine. Ronnie sits on a tall stool in the Wood Duck Lounge and keeps getting the uneasy feeling that everyone's staring at them. He's had a bad feeling about this trip from the start, and now, he thinks, he's managed to unnerve himself. Lyle sits next to him, happily munching peanuts from a bowl on the bar and drinking beer, watching the television bolted to the wall above the bartender's right shoulder. That's the only thing they haven't got out in Lyle's new ice fishing house on the lake. A television. Ronnie can see the wheels in his friend's head turning already. How can he add one? There, now, wasn't that old man in the corner staring at them with an ugly look on his face? It couldn't be. They don't know any of these people. They haven't been up here in twenty years. At least, Ronnie hasn't, since they were both eleven years old. In fact, Ronnie hadn't seen Lyle in something over a decade when he called up out of the blue and invited Ronnie on an ice fishing trip to the old lake. I've got an ice house you wouldn't believe, Lyle had shouted into the phone when Ronnie hesitated. The Taj Mahal of fish houses. We'll catch that big old duke at last. Ronnie had been struck dumb. Heck, they hadn't been fishing together since before they knew girls existed. And that was all they used to do together. Every summer they would spend every day, all day, out on the banks of the bridges of the surface of bad medicine with a fishing line in the calm, clear water. Fishing for the duke. Now Lyle had gotten some kind of incredible deal on the greatest fish house ever built, and he wanted Ronnie to travel twenty years back in time to the little lake they'd spent their youth on. Sitting in the dim bar, Ronnie wishes he hadn't come. The waitress glares at him every time he looks at her. Is it just that the people up here are hostile to outsiders? Lyle is oblivious to it all, drinking beer just about as fast as he can and scooping up big handfuls of the free peanuts. Ronnie has kept only the most minimal contact with him over the years. Just enough to know that his boyhood friend has been through two marriages, a couple failed businesses, and a stint in the state prison for car theft. Somehow, after the lazy, hazy days of those summers, Lyle's life went astray. What Ronnie hadn't known was that Lyle came up here every year, at least once a year, to fish for the Duke. A lot of people never believed in the Duke. For all Ronnie knows, nobody even remembers him now. He was a legend back in those far-off days. A giant, cunning old muskie more ancient than anyone could know for sure. A fish grown so big and smart that he was impossible to catch. Even back then, Ronnie's mother had advised him that it was just a whopper of a fish story, that the men were fooling the boys. But Ronnie and Lyle had known better, because they had seen the Duke twice, The first time they were standing on the old railroad trestle at the far end of the lake with their lines in the water on a hot summer afternoon. The dark shape had appeared from the deeper water and coasted silently, slowly, toward the shade under the bridge. It had been enormous, six or seven feet long and as big as a man. And even standing there on that trestle, Ronnie had been terrified by its sheer dark mass. They had run from the bridge leaving their poles, as if the great beast might knock the sturdy old pilings down and devour them both. On the way back to their cabins, Lyle had been a madman, like Ronnie had never seen him before, gesturing with shaking hands and shouting at the top of his voice. Lyle had held up his hand to show Ronnie that it was shaking, and his eyes had been full of a wild light that Ronnie had never seen before. The second time they saw the Duke was even more terrifying. They were out in the rowboat when the dark shape rose through the water, looking even bigger than before and gliding just as purposefully. It disappeared into the murk again in a matter of seconds, and the two of them were looking at each other with saucer-sized eyes when the jolt came to the bottom of the boat. Lyle, who was standing, pitched toward the water, and Ronnie, in an act he could never claim responsibility for, reached out and grabbed Lyle's shirt and pulled him back into the boat and on top of himself. Lyle's eyes, inches away, had held that wild fire again, and he'd said right into Ronnie's open mouth, You just saved my life. Ronnie had never been able to believe it. In fact, looking back on it, he couldn't even believe that the great fish had nearly upset the boat. It seemed that Lyle must have been standing and simply lost his balance. One more before we go back out, Lyle asks him now, pointing at Ronnie's empty glass. Sure, says Ronnie, and Lyle signals to the bartender, who responds with a sour look. 
Ronnie's had enough beer to lean forward on his stool and engage the bartender with a glare. What's your problem? I ain't got a problem. Maybe you got one. Maybe you'd best be careful when you get out there on that ice. What's that supposed to mean? You got yourself a real nice fishing mansion there, eh? And for a steal, I hear. What a lucky break for you boys that Marge Nygaard's husband and two boys died in there, and she couldn't stand the sight of it any more. Would take whatever she was offered for it. I gotta say, there's a limited number of men who can appreciate a bargain like that. Lyle, said Ronnie, turning to his friend. Come on, says Lyle, standing up. Forget about that last beer. We don't want to spend our money here anyway. Take a look, the bartender tells Ronnie. He points to a photograph some kind of little instamatic thing, pinned above the bar. In it, two boys, two teenage boys, sit grinning next to a smiling man who could be no one but their father. Their mother, apparently Marge, looks away from the camera with a worried look on her face, as if she senses the impending doom. Below the photograph is a glass jar with a few wrinkled dollars in it. Lyle, Ronnie says again. Lyle's already out the door. Lyle, shouts Ronnie, striding after him across the frozen parking lot. There were three of them, Lyle says, not turning around. The heater in the fish house went bad, and they died of carbon dioxide. Jesus, they built it so good there were no air leaks. If they'd done a lousier job, they would have survived. Ain't that a joke? So you... She'd have sold it anyway. She'd have given it away. Who would pass up a deal like that? Now Ronnie remembers how the chimney pipe from the heater is wrapped around clumsily with insulation, how the hacked hole in the roof is at odds with the careful carpentry of the rest of the shack. It's Lyle's typically sloppy handiwork, half-hearted and half-done. Damn, Lyle, says Ronnie, and breathes in the frigid air. It's colder than it was when they went into the bar a few hours ago. The sun is going down over the frozen lake, turning the cloudless sky pink on the horizon. As Ronnie looks out over the shadowed stands of dark pines on the snow-covered shoreline, he is reminded, as always, of the natives who camped around the shore of this lake in the centuries past. It was they who had named the lake Bad Medicine, and their legend spoke of a giant fish as well, connected him with an evil medicine man who once lived on the lake's shores. And if that cunning fish had lived as far back as that, then he was ancient and venerable beyond human comprehension. They get in the truck and bump down the icy boat ramp, driving onto the rough surface of the frozen lake. The sun is behind the horizon now, and the other fish shacks on the ice are just angular black shapes against the snow, some of them with yellow light spilling from tiny windows. As Ronnie and Lyle bounce along the ruts in the ice, Ronnie can just make out silhouettes of the landmarks of their youth in the dying light. There, the narrow point of land where their families rented cabins every summer, over there, the raised skeleton of the railroad trestle. A wind swept across the flat lake and rocked the truck. Ahead, the square outline of Lyle's fish house loomed against the white background. Let's catch some fish, says Lyle. It's warm inside, but Ronnie shivers, looking around the shack's carefully constructed interior. They didn't suffer, Lyle tells him, making a face. You just fall asleep and don't wake up. They just fell asleep. Ronnie nods and sits, but he doesn't feel any better. He is suddenly, acutely, aware that this is their bench. Above his head is the ingenious little shelf and coat rack that they built. Over there is the window they looked out for the last time before falling asleep forever. And over there, there is the propane space heater Lyle has broken loose from its snug little cubby hole and dragged into the middle of the room with a rickety stovepipe punched through the tightly constructed roof. Didn't it bother you? Ronnie asks. Not the least little bit? For the first time, Lyle looks uncomfortable. Why should it? It was just a good deal. I don't know why everybody has to act like I killed them myself. Heck, I didn't even know them. How did you know it was for sale? It was in the newspaper. She advertised it for sale? No, the story. About her family. I just called her up and... Ronnie looks again at the dislocated heater. Look, says Lyle. Heck, let's fish. Ronnie has all his tackle with him, and a short, reed-thin fishing rod which he baits up with a small jig. The hole in the floor of the fish shack is huge, two feet in diameter, because Lyle is expecting to catch the duke, and there's no sense hooking him through a five-inch hole. 
It makes the hole a real hazard inside the confines of the shack, though. A hole a man could fall through is not the right thing to have on the floor of a house erected over the ice of a lake, when the only two options available to a man are drinking and sitting, or drinking and standing. Lyle is rigging up some kind of deep sea pole and line, ancient by the look of it, and big enough to hook marlins off the coast of Florida. Ronnie can't believe it. What the heck have you got there? Stringing line and unraveling snarls from a reel so old it's rusted thin in some places. No sense in hooking the duke on a twenty-pound test. No sense at all. Ronnie can't help laughing at the sight of him wrestling with the huge spinner. Where'd you get that thing? Off the widow of some shark-eaten sailor? He's instantly sorry he said it. In fact, he can't even imagine where the words came from, and to hide his embarrassment he cracks open their bottle of schnapps and offers it to Lyle. To catching whatever we came here to catch. I hear that, says Lyle, and drinks deeply. Ronnie pulls a big hit from the bottle and feels the fire rush from his belly to his brain. That's when he looks down and sees the face staring at him from the dark hole in the ice. A face only inches below the surface, but as real as his own, looking up through the frigid water. He screams and pulls back, and Lyle is right there grabbing him, the silly pole forgotten on the floor of the shack, grabbing him and pulling him back onto the bench. Jesus, says Ronnie. What is it? Ronnie doesn't know what to say. I guess I just lost my balance for a second. Thanks. I owe you, buddy. You know that. You don't owe me nothing, says Ronnie, because he can't think of anything to say, because he knows in a flash where he's seen that face before, in that photograph in the wood duck. He looks cautiously into the hole again, but there's nothing there except the blackness and a few chips of floating ice. The bottle of schnapps gets passed back and forth, and, for Ronnie, the fishing's good. He catches a pile of eating-sized sunfish and a smallmouth bass. It's getting colder by the minute, and the fish are frozen before they're dead in the snowbank outside the shack's door. Lyle sits with his huge rod cocked over the hole and doesn't even look like he's having fun. Why don't you go for something smaller, Ronnie tells him as his lion jumps again. I'm going to catch that duke, says Lyle grimly. Do you have to catch him tonight? Lyle takes a hit from the bottle and sits for a moment, staring into the dark hole in the ice. I've screwed up my life, he says finally. Haven't we all? No, at least not like me. I told you me and Marla are having troubles? Yeah, Marla is his third wife. Well, we ain't having troubles. She's leaving me for some other poor son of a gun. I don't even know his name. Huh, says Ronnie. You know, says Lyle, those boys had the right idea. The, yeah, the boys who died in here. Their daddy lived up here. They probably would have lived up here all their lives. I'll bet they were happy. We don't know that, says Ronnie. He is uncomfortable talking about them. Heck yes, they were, says Lyle. Look at this place. They had the life. I'd never have gone wrong if I'd stayed up here. Ronnie has the eerie feeling that someone is staring at the back of his neck and turns his head slowly so as not to alert Lyle. There's nothing in the little shack but the two of them. But why did he think he caught a glimpse of movement over by the stove out of the corner of his eye? That's why I went up there and talked the old lady into selling me this place, Lyle is saying, because I thought maybe I could feel some of what they did. I don't know if it was the right thing, Lyle. They died happy. You can know that. At least they had that. Ronnie holds up a finger for silence. What is that he's hearing? What, says Lyle drunkenly, but the sound, whatever it was outside, is gone. Let's not talk about those guys anymore, okay, says Ronnie. Gives me the creeps. All right, says Lyle. Then, do you think they ever saw the Duke? I don't know, says Ronnie. Because I don't think the carbon monoxide got them. Dioxide, says Ronnie. What do you mean? dioxide. It doesn't matter because it's not what got them. It was the Duke, you see. He saw that they were going to leave, that their lives were going to get screwed up. So he came and got them, like he tried to do to me that time. What? says Ronnie. His senses are playing tricks on him. A moment ago he thought he saw a man-sized shadow fall across the single window. They should have stayed here their whole lives, where they would be happy. They were going to leave and they shouldn't have, so he came and saved them, you see? No, says Ronnie, his head spinning. Lyle sits for a moment, thinking. You think they knew about the old medicine man? You remember him? Of course. 
That story had come down from a couple different sources when they were young, similar enough for them to have taken it as fact. Well, I'm just like him. I haven't ever done anything right, and I haven't ever made anything happen the right way. And I'm as screwed as he ever was sitting there on that shore. You sure you remember him? Like he's forgotten any of it. There is something golden about those times, precisely because of how much they didn't know. They didn't know much about the Vietnam War or the Cold War, and they didn't know a thing about marital relations or unrelations. All that was an ephemeral adult haze to them. Heat, cold, sleep, awake, comprised the full four dimensions of their universe. And when they listened to the stories of the old medicine man, they listened with a mental palate clean of anything else. So when that feathered gentleman was described to them by one adult or another, he was as real to them as the sun on the white sand beach, or the buzzing of a deer fly in the ear, or the smooth hulk of a duke moving slowly by. The legend was that he had been a bad shaman, a medicine man who used his magic for evil, or whose magic always went wrong. It depended on who was telling the story. A man banished, sentenced to live alone on the banks of this lake, shunned by his own people for the bad things that happened here. Some accounts said that he was still living on the shore of the lake when the white men first came in the 19th century, others that he had disappeared long before that, wading calmly into the still water until it covered his head, disappearing without a ripple. One thing the stories were all in agreement on, he could still be heard humming and chanting when the moon was full or the fog persisted on the lake early in the morning. As boys, they had ventured out on foggy mornings and moonlit nights, but had never heard a sound. They found things they thought were remnants of an old Indian camp, but they had always turned out to be something else, an old cabin foundation, the wreck of a hog sty. Ronnie looks up now and sees the moon is full and yellow in the window. You ain't like that old Indian, he tells Lyle. The heck I'm not. That's when the knocks come. Three of them. Slow, measured, precise, on the door of the shack. Somebody's here, says Lyle, but he doesn't move. Ronnie stands and goes to the door, but he dreads opening it. In his heart, he knows there's nobody there. Go on, says Lyle. It's the sheriff or something. Don't give them any excuse. The shack feels overly warm to Ronnie. It seems that he can't clear his head. He opens the door to see who's there, and there is no one, nothing moving but the snow blowing in thin wisps across the ice. Cold cracks, says Lyle with disgust. Sure, says Ronnie. He looks suspiciously at the heater, but knows Lyle will take offense if he says anything. He wishes his head would clear. While I'm up, he says, I'm going to step out for a second. Don't freeze yourself. It's a real possibility, and Ronnie wishes, belatedly, that their unfortunate benefactors had gone so far as to build a biffy in the shack. The wind slices through his coat and makes his lungs sting. The ice groans loudly, gigantically, underneath him. And though he knows the sound is natural and harmless, he wishes foolishly that they had set up nearer the other fish houses. He cannot ever recall being out on the lake when it was so cold. And then he hears it. At first it sounds like the low moan of the ice again, but then he hears it rise on the wind, a keening, rattling wail that fades in and out with the strength of the wind. It seems to be coming closer. He looks around wildly for the source, but it seems to be coming from all directions. He throws open the shack's door and says to Lyle, Do you hear that? Do you hear it? Hear what? says Lyle and then Ronnie can hear a companion to the noise from inside the shack. He looks up at the roof and sees the wind howling, whining through the lengthened pipe Lyle has added to the heater chimney, and sees the anchor wires vibrating and rattling in the wind. Nothing, says Ronnie, and closes the door again. Still, it is an odd noise, and one that doesn't seem perfectly matched to the wind rushing through the narrow chimney pipe. There seems to be a lower, more distant sound that he could hear more clearly if the wind would die down only for a moment. Then something moves against the snow, and Ronnie looks to see that they do, indeed, have company. Someone stands silhouetted against the white snow. Hello there, he says, and then realizes there is no one there at all, that there is only the snow and the ice and the black countryside all around him. When he backs in, Lyle seems hardly to have noticed he was gone. 
He sits with the empty bottle of schnapps leaning against his hip. His eyes glazed and half closed. Wake up, Ronnie tells him. I am awake. The wind is rattling through the chimney pipe again, and Ronnie tosses his line into the hole. The sides of the shack pop and creak in the cold. Ronnie's line hangs slack in the cold water. Forget I said any of that, says Lyle, and Ronnie nods, his head stuffy again. He is about to make an excuse to go back outside when Lyle's thick line jerks slightly and pulls gently into the water. Hello, says Lyle. Hello, indeed. The big fishing rod bends slowly but unmistakably, and Ronnie cannot believe his eyes. Lyle sits back in his chair and pulls against the rod, his gaze intent on the black hole in the bottom of the shack. It's a snag, says Ronnie, knowing it isn't true, knowing that whatever it is has to be moving away from them. This isn't like a boat. Ronnie's rod is bent like a willow switch, the tip nearly touching the water. Dog on, he says, and begins to pull. Let it go, says Ronnie. Cut the line. Baloney, shouts Lyle, pulling back and turning the reel with all his might. Get a net. But that's ridiculous, because whatever has a hold of that line is ten times bigger than any net will hold, and Ronnie cannot even think straight. The sheer flex of the rod paralyzes him, though he knows he should move to cut the line himself. He wants to tell Lyle to let go of the rod, but his brain is sluggish and his mouth will not work. He watches silently as Lyle reels and pulls, reels and pulls, and the thick, wet line wraps itself around the spinner. He knows, of course, that it must be a log or a tree stump, somehow snagged under water. But then the black shape rises in the hole, and it is oddly, terribly, unlike any underwater flotsam Ronnie has ever seen. He knows what it is, then. It is a body they have managed to hook up from the cold water, dead weight that rolls and turns to show a human face, and then it moves. As it comes up, the head is blunt. No, it is rough, or feathered, and the long feathers are slicked down with green lake slime. It is the head of a man, the lure hooked in his broad mouth, and as he comes up out of the hole, he raises powerful naked arms covered in the green ooze and reaches for Lyle. Get out, screams Ronnie, get out. But the thing already has Lyle by the ankles, and the water pulled out of the hole with it makes the floor slick. Not half man, half fish, but all man, dripping cold water, feathered headdress glued against his head by centuries in the lake, he has grasped Lyle by the feet and pulls him back toward the hole. Lyle is screaming incoherently now, kicking, but the floor is too slippery for resistance, and the man pulls Lyle into the hole. Help me, Ronnie, help me. Ronnie goes to grab him, but his arms are wet, and the creature has him firmly by the legs, pulling him down through the ice, legs, then hips, and waist and shoulders. Lyle makes one last attempt to grab the sides of the hole, but the ice offers nothing to hold on to, and he bumps over the rim, his head disappearing beneath the dark surface of the water. Ronnie's lungs feel compressed by an iron band, and he lunges for the door, tumbling through it and out onto the ice. Crawling, choking, he knows that he must go back to save Lyle. Lyle, he calls, foolishly hopeful. There's no answer, and he crawls back to the door. There is no way of knowing how much of what he saw happened, and how much was hallucination. He props the door open with a clod of snow and looks inside. The shack is empty. Lyle's huge rod lies on the wet floor. Lyle, says Ronnie. He crosses to the hole in the center of the floor, and there, staring sightlessly up at him, is Lyle's peaceful face a few inches below the surface. Jesus, says Ronnie, trying desperately to remember what really happened. As he watches, Lyle's eyes flick to life and his mouth moves soundlessly. With a flick of his body, he slips deeper into the hole and disappears into the black water below. The End